Levi John, do you see the content? John is seen. No. No? Okay, you projected. Um, John, who, who has a 30th birthday? Whom should we congratulate? You have a balloons with uh, two number. You? Okay, let's uh, tell happy birthday to John. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. John. Happy birthday. <laughs> Today? Today, exactly. Today. Really today? Oh, we need them to sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> Not today. Today. Just yes, one. yesterday, no to singing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, happy birthday. Have a uh, health, success, inspiration. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Send SMS uh, to one of us if we do not hear you, because uh, right now we are going to put uh, slides on main screen and then it will disable uh, voice line. So is there only John? I'm no, John and Levi. Uh, Okay, well, thanks for coming uh, and investing your time into these uh, meetings. Today there will be a research presentation by Aaron, and uh, he will tell about his uh, research with a strategic overview and assembly of the pieces together. Okay, floor is yours. And Please check if uh, it is the right version of the of slides. Uh, probably be close enough. Um, so yeah, this is presentation for today's group meeting. I don't know what is today, even ten. Ten? Yeah. I just knew it was after the fourth. One but I that. <laughs> so you were not sure about today's date? Yeah, I think. Well, I think I started made it, making it like a week ago, and I had no idea what. Today's date would have been. This remote. So, events of the port. This time, yeah, the remote okay. is pretty slow. It's a great connection with John. <laughs> Maybe it's on occasion of his birthday. John, have you. Is he hearing us? He's, he, he's yeah. hearing us, but we, we don't hear him. But he can just show by signs. We have very great connection today with you. Usually, you are not as well seen as today. I don't know, maybe you got a new internet or something. <laughs> new package. Yeah, Higher speed or something. <laughs> so, yeah, just before beginning, just a little bit of background. So, like over the past, I don't know, half a year or so, I presented a couple of times on uh, two projects I've been working on a doped quantum dot and an intrinsic quantum dot. And most of that has been submitted to journal PCMC already. And then, I guess, uh, Dimitri's plan was to take some of the uh, Leftover remaining parts for the intrinsic dot, and then write that, formulate that as a letter for the physical chemistry. Phys physical chemistry. This is letter. your goal for your publication, or it was already published there? Uh, goal. So this is what this is intended for. And only to the letters. Yes. I, what if it? What if it will be? What if it's not accepted? Mm. Plan B. Mm. <laughs> Plan B, and their loss, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> okay. But, so, yeah, okay, the goal. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, I don't know, I've seen the journal chemistry, phys uh, journal physical chemistry letters before, but I had no idea, like, what's different about it compared to other journals. And I guess, this I just found this on the website. You can kind of read the <laughs> journal scope yourself, if you can read it. But basically, they have different types. You can have, like, people giving their perspectives, their own ideas on materials. Every kind of original research articles and 
I guess that's probably what mine will end up being focused more on is the original aspect instead of providing our two cents on, I don't know, the properties beyond. Uh, but your goal is to have a short uh, paper, right? Short. So because lattice means it has to be short. It's like a short report. Well, that's probably what they enjoy, but I've seen some letters that just kind of go on and on and on. So. <laughs> It, it depends on the editor, but usually, usually, the words letters in the title of the journal kind of is mm -hmm, is yeah. a limit in number of pages. Uh, usually, they should have a limit in number of pages. <coughs> yeah, so I think on number kind of, of figures, and some journals are more restrict, some journals less restrict. Yeah, they kind of they don't explicitly say, but they say that the point of the journals is for rapid publication. So if you have something important to say, to get it out quick, so the idea. Of course, was, everything we do is important. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I guess that's just kind of uh, going into what to expect or how to try to formulate the, or try to organize the data that I presented. And but maybe there are some other ideas, like let's say uh, maybe alternatives, not exactly plan B means low level <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, journals, but uh, alternative to these journals, maybe some people know, what, what would you kind of recommend? Uh, what are the journals, maybe not ACS journals, which might be kind of pretty much uh, comparable to this one. Anything, anything that no has... Uh, I have an idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anything that has uh, word nano in, in the name of the journal. Nano letters. It's, it's more competitive. This, uh, nano letters yeah, is, is, is much harder to publish. Than this. There's also ACS energy, energy letters. Mm -hmm. We're I think uh, journal of energy letters. And, and they specifically it. like uh, papers and perscans. Mm -hmm. yeah, Definitely, it's it probably even more focused journal, so you probably have a better chance. And also, impact factor is very high, probably even higher than for this one, but not very much more higher, right? Yeah, I think they're all around like plus or minus ten in that range. Some are thick, thirteen. Some plus are minus ten. No, or 10 plus or minus. Oh, okay. nine, <laughs> nine, eight, I would say, yeah. yeah. So I think uh, JAX has now citations something around 14.7. Mm -hmm. This guy's low. Yeah, yeah. Right. relatively low. Oh. Yeah, but it's higher than the yeah. Journal of Chemistry C. There's also Materials Chemistry Journal, also ACS Journal. Materials, I think mm -hmm. it's either Materials Chemistry. Uh, with a focus on the materials. It's also having a impact factor around nine, but there is no restriction on the size because there's no word letter. So it's more like a full style paper. So if it's really long, you probably have to choose something different. Mm -hmm. There is also applied, there are several new journals, uh, which kind of a series. So it's apply, uh, apply energy materials, not energy letters, but energy material, uh, applied energy materials, ACS applied energy materials, ACS applied nanomaterials, materials, yeah. Okay, yeah. and um, ACS applied interfaces, um, how's it called, surfaces, interfaces. Yeah, those ones seem more like, well, the articles I see on that, they seem more experimental based. Right. But maybe. But no, 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 there is not, like, again, so if you, if you read carefully the, uh, the scope of journals, so they usually don't just request experimental papers, mm -hmm. right? So, okay. If you want to try something beyond this years, I would say there would be nanoscale journal. This is Royal Society journal, mm -hmm. which is also high impact journal. Be, well, it's less than this ones, but comparable. Um, there's journals like small, it's also European journal. Small? Small. 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 Never seen that one. Well, small. because it's European journal. <laughs> you still have a very high, like if you Google and check impact factors, but I mean, I like the idea that you start thinking about the paper, I mean, the, not, uh, you start thinking about paper exactly to the journal where you want to publish, but I would say you probably can then really check what other possibilities are there, mm -hmm. rather than just focus on, uh, on this journal, uh, which is very good journal, Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters, but I said that there are really many alternatives which probably very, very comparable to this one. Mm -hmm. Beyond the, like there are several in ACS journal series, and there is definitely several beyond ACS European journals. Mm -hmm. That's true. I think I think one reason that we wanted to pick this one is it seems like well, whenever I look at journals from this, it's they're also they're disseminating information, but it's also like kind of advertising like the specific instrumentations or whatever specialty they have. So that could be another reason that we do this. Just 
showing the capabilities that we have as a group and what we can calculate. Because, I don't know, I usually see more, I see like a lot of letters like floating floating around, yeah, so it's easier to it's like get Nothing wrong with your choice. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that there are much more than just this. Mm -hmm. And if you're choosing something, I was like, it's probably should should have some kind of reasoning that you really know uh, not only about this journal but other possibilities as well. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, based on t-shirt, labeling error is, is very serious. <laughs> <laughs> United V5? Yeah, I think it's a cancer shirt. That's what this little... Uh -oh. I thought it's a gam. Oh, okay. Well, it is a gamma too, probably. <laughs> I think it's supposed to be a ribbon. No. I don't know, it's not my shirt. I think I stole it from one of my friends, just because it fit me. But anyway, so, yeah, that's philosophy behind journal physical chemistry letters. And so, I was thinking along the lines of like kind of advertising or grouping the specific uh, skills that we have as a group together. So, some of the main things that we can look at is I got flipped a little bit. But a uh, ground state electronic structure of materials, we can compute absorb spectra of materials pretty available readily and have capabilities that other groups don't have. Uh, a wide variety of topics I call structure to property relations. So I mean, you could literally put any sort of category into structure to property relations. But when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about effect of ligand choices on the quantum dot, so either full passivation versus under passivation, and what its effect on electronic structure, and then alternative ligands that people use try to passivate these to increase their quantum yields. <coughs> and we also do, well, the most competitive aspect of our research that we have is excited state dynamics of materials in general, so hot carrier cooling and computing photoluminescent properties of materials. And so how do these all kind of connect together? So the ground state <coughs> electronic structure serves a basis for absorption spectra calculations because with the ground state electronic structure, you define electronic states. And then those, <coughs> and then determining on orbital overlaps or atomic orbitals that overlap with each other, you can, uh, those will determine your uh, absorption spectra for dipole out transitions anyway. And then then your ground state electronic structure corresponds to your excited state dynamics because we use ground state structure as the basis for excited state. So that's how those kind of correlate together. And on the right hand side, you can go back from structure property relations to kind of connect all, I can connect all these. So the types of ligands that you have and the type of passivation is going to affect ground state electronic structure. So mm -hmm. here you are not including the part on your doping. Or right, this is just intrinsic. Okay. <coughs> because, well, mostly because they haven't figured out the... So your main focus is on ligands yeah. on the surface. So, yeah, basically the interaction with ligands with the cross-guide quantum dot and then just general properties of... So title, probably. The first thing which you probably can think about for your paper is a title. Oh, well... No? <laughs> well, I guess I'm, I'm going from the opposite view, I guess. So, I think Dimitri gave some advice of Sergei Tretriak about uh, different types of research approaches you can have. You can either have like, high precision, one aim, one bullet, you have one shot, or you can either have like buckshot and try to spray everywhere, and then you have, you have better chances of getting success. So, a lot of these is like just exploring different paths and seeing what's worth going down. Eventually, so I don't have a specific so title. You yeah. thinking that you probably have to split this and make two papers instead of one from this material? So what? From so this uh, information. So I'm just kind of outlining outlining what I have already, and then deciding what's worth exploring, what's interesting to explore, that could give novel insights to these cross-site quantum dots. So after overview of uh, available things. Can you make reverse engineering and tell which challenge, which experimental challenge is, is uh, targeted to be addressed? 
by this by this research. You're an expert in the field <coughs> right now, right? If you're in the stage of writing a paper, you definitely know what's going on in the field. Right? What, what is not known in the field and so what, you can, what can really be say what exactly of your parts are really the most challenging, the most important, the most interesting to not not mm. to you or to me, but really to the community who are working on a perovskite. Yeah, well, I guess from that sense it would be a big size state. The oh, on excited state properties, mm -hmm. which. Uh, but what exactly is the challenge there? People can measure excited state properties. What's the problem? Origin. Huh? Like origin of where these properties arise from. Uh -huh. So the popular name you'll see thrown around is Rashba effect. And then the people usually use that to explain why either a non radiative relaxation is suppressed. In materials or why you get uh, so flipping of your... I will rephrase it again. So you're saying that the main challenge in the field right now, uh, especially if we're focusing on uh, on this perovskites <coughs> quantum dots, right, not just mm -hmm. perovskites in general, is really to make them luminescent. And there's still a sparse, or how say, maybe not sparse, but maybe there are, uh, uh, there, there, there are a lot of maybe research focused on these questions, but they are not given the very clear ideas how to control the uh, emission of these materials. Like di different groups probably report very different values for, for, for quantum yield of these materials, right? And in some cases, they're really very emissive at this range of energy, since other cases, they're not emissive or what? This is a challenge? Um. So the challenge is. Oh, it's not a challenge to make these guys to be really bright, nice. Yeah, they're like as materials. soon as you make them, they're pretty much bright. Even if they degrade, they still have luminescent properties of like fifty percent quantum mm -hmm. yield. So it's. So it's not a problem to make them bright. It's understanding why they're bright. Okay. And then, then, then what is the challenge? Uh, yeah, I can didn't get it yet. <laughs> so people can make it. People can uh, synthesize the materials, mm -hmm. and without really a big efforts. If they synthesize this quantum dots, they already see pretty high quantum yields. 50% is really very high quantum yields. Mm, that's even after they degrade, so we can make them fresh, they're right. brighter. So it looks like, yeah, you just synthesize and they're bright right away. Mm -hmm. then, then, then what is really still unclear there? So in, in terms of this dynamics, what excited dynamics? So I guess a couple of things are people, I guess I didn't put it into the presentation, but I was just looking at some literature are refreshing on some of the literature and like bulk perovskites they have very slow hot carrier cooling which is useful for like uh, solar cells because you want slow uh, recombination but in quantum dots they see like sub picosecond around like 200 300 picosecond non radiative yeah, relaxation non relaxation or not oh. hot, hot carrier cooling ah, relaxation then, rates mm -hmm, relaxation rates and then People either are trying to understand whether it's Auger effects or whether it's phonon processes or the mechanism of right. this quick mm, relaxation. Or due to rate. ligands. There's usually a three that are flown for suspected for cooling rates. And so, so what affects this uh, effects in higher extent? Choice of ligands or quantum confinement? It's a good question. Would it be a challenge? Well, um, again, what do you think? If you just look on the model of the quantum confinement, let's say you just really make your perovskite start with a bulk, right? Where the relaxation are very, very slow. And then you go smaller, smaller, smaller to really nanometer sizes as you're working, right? So just using the knowledge of quantum mechanics, what do you think? What would be the effect of this confinement on relaxation rates intuitively based on a a kind of general knowledge of quantum mechanics. You just squeeze your charges together so they're more likely to scatter up each other or interact, or just, I guess, non radiative relaxation would increase. But we're talking about interband relaxation, what, what you call hot, uh, hot cooling, hot carrier cooling, or something like this, mm. right? Um, what, what you're saying is right, but how this really deals with your uh, relaxation? Okay, what what happens with electronic levels when you go to the confined systems? Oh, they become more sparse. Far and? Further apart. Okay. And? More discrete? Yeah. 
So. So you have more bands. Or so. Higher energy. How this affects the interaction dissonance or his uh, vibrations? We need more of them, or it's the probability of a phonon with a certain energy to jump the gap is less. So it's it takes decreasing. longer. So it should be slow, actually, right? right? So intuitively, the kind of Feynman should lead to even slow relaxation rates comparing to the bulk materials, because you really increase in a mismatch between phonon energies, which is usually small for, 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 for the inorganic <coughs> type of materials, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the low frequency phonons or low frequency vibrations. Comparing to the splitting between your electronic levels, which is definitely growing and getting, you can really estimate it based on your models to see what exactly the splitting between the levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? you the band edges, it's like. And it's exactly the same story for the semiconducting quantum dots, right? So again, people mm -hmm. were expecting that relaxation rate should be decreasing, that the relaxation should be slow than in bulk because of this confinement effect, because you having a mismatch between energy of much larger mismatch between energy of phonons and the electro uh, splitting between electronic levels when you go to the kind uh, to the quantum dots comparing to the bulk materials. Mm -hmm. But experimentally, they don't see it. Actually, they see not faster in case of uh, semiconducting quantum dots. It's comparable. The rates are not really changed in bulk versus quantum dots, and they become a little bit quicker. It's also not sub picoseconds, but picoseconds. So it's picosecond rate for the bulk material, picosecond rate for the quantum dots, like cat selenide, cat telluride, lead selenide, gallium arsenide, and so on. Mm -hmm. Silicon quantum dots as well. So they all have pretty much kind of you know picosecond rate relaxation, which is very similar to what is uh, seen in the bulk materials, which contradicts to the simple ideas of the confinement change in the uh, confinement effect on the energy levels, right? Mm -hmm. So, and again, there was a discussion on this question for quantum dots. Now you kind of also see the contradiction, probably even more significantly seen in, your, in this system, in perovskites, right? So looks again, so the confinement should lead to completely opposite trends, mm -hmm. rather than what is seen experimentally. So that's really becoming, like if you put it in this language, right? So you probably can see that, then this challenge becomes really very interesting. Like, oh, really, why? Mm -hmm. Why it goes against the very simple idea of this particle in the box or whatever kind of very simple model, which looks like you can easily apply to this one, and clearly the levels are becoming sparser, right? Becoming more discrete. Then, 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 then there definitely should be some other mechanisms, and probably this would be your focus of your paper, really, kind of. And again, what are the mechanisms? Surface ligands on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. This type of things. They probably now really having probably the most significant impact comparing just to the confinement. And they provide some additional channels for this quick relaxation. Yeah, they're somehow. actually, I was gonna but touch But what exactly, like how this works? What exactly, like just to say that, oh, we are guessing that this would be probably the reason, right? It, this is, this is good that we have some ideas, but we need really to prove it to, to understand how exactly it works, what exactly is the physics behind it, or mm -hmm. chemistry behind it. And I guess you can easily wrap these kind of ideas into your challenge introduction part of your paper, really focusing on, on trying to answer the question, what exactly is the mechanism which governing this fast relaxation, which kind of goes against the confinement um, idea of the confinement effect. Yeah, and, and definitely this probably would be the role of ligands and you can really then move to the more detailed explanation and focus on, 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 on ligands. Yeah, I've thought of it, but you know, I think it was one of our group meeting discussions we talked about trying to get spectral densities from our autocorrelation functions. Mm -hmm. I think, didn't you say something about we don't have the resolution? Or it's like our we run too long at time steps, so we don't get as good. No. Well, um, th there are different things. There are technical aspects, and there is a strategic planning. So you, uh, we, we yeah, can be aware of mechanisms and think about them, even without doing experiments or calculations. Right now, the question is just how to navigate in the space of this uh, knowledge area. Mm -hmm. 
we, we cannot address all questions by making an experiment or running simulation, but we can overview the field and pick up uh, the um, <coughs> spot where we can contribute. Okay. So uh, your central point is really showing how these relaxation rates are affected by ligands and by size? No, I don't think you change the size of your quantum, of your quantum dot. Um, Just by ligands, right? Yeah, for this model. We are working on bigger dots, but... But this is definitely, it looks, looks like that this is your central point. And again, for this central point, in your introduction part, you can really make a kind of very clear statement of a challenge. Why the question which you're addressing, how the ligands affect the relaxation, why this question is really important, interesting, and, and needed to someone. <laughs> So, and, and this kind of wraps up the whole story. And then you can go into the details. You start with your ground state, with your some other features, and so on, right? Yeah, that makes sense. But your, 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 your core part would be really this one, which means it's, it's definitely probably will be at the end of your uh, paper, as the very last chapter of your paper, probably, or last part of your paper, right? And before you start with the ground state properties and so on, and really kind of end up with this final results for the relaxation and finally answer the question why the relaxation is quick. Mm -hmm. Like what exactly is the role of this or that ligands play, right? Because I guess it's probably because of ligands, that's why it's quick. Yeah, because I think, well, I didn't get there yet, but. Oh, you don't know the answer yet? No, I was gonna say it's the, the rates we computed, they're a little bit quicker than what's seen in experiment. And I was gonna but say yeah, that's if probably, you think about qualitative approach, right? right I was gonna say that's probably going to our surface. It's like, well, our quantum dot is basically all surface, so it's mostly if we can impact. But in experiments, so. they really work with exactly the same size systems, or the no, quantum dots are bigger. The bigger, like ours so. is like one point five. So then, bigger. why you expect to have exactly the same numbers? Of course, the size will be affecting these uh, values, but qualitatively, at least, right? Just thinking, what exactly the origin of what exactly contributes to this uh, relaxation? What is the channel? Right, that's why I was saying that that's why ours are probably a little bit quicker. It's because we have more ligand to, to Because like you have much more surface. Okay. So, that's, yeah. so you have more driving force from the surface compared to if you have a 10 nanometer dot, it's, you're gonna have less density. Yeah, so, so you already explains why it's quicker, but it's, a, like, it's not really destroys your main ideas for this paper, main points which you want to address in this paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe, I don't know. So we are done with three slides out of 33, right? <laughs> 33? A lot of them are transitions. So and yeah, just how structure property relations can relate to other aspects of the research. So how ligands can affect the size state dynamics, for example. So first, I guess we'll start talking about ground state electronic structure of these quantum dots. So I figured since a lot of these letters, they kind of take like uh, some sort of a little bit of perspective or historical notes. So the first place to start for quantum dots would be with papers by Bruss when they're originally uh, kind of discovering quantum dots or quantum confinement <coughs> systems. So this is like one of, uh, it wasn't his first paper, but it's, I don't know, it was the best one I found that kind of gives an intuitive introduction to uh, the approximations they use to describe the electronic structure in quantum dots. And so when they're first looking at these systems, they're seeing that the smaller they make the cluster, the more blue shifted that you see the absorption spectra. So this is the, represents the bulk band gap for, what are you looking at? Zinc, selenide, some sort of system. So this would be like a bulk material. And then if you make a smaller, medium-sized cluster, they call it, you see absorption increase and then blue shift, and then even increase more in blue shift. And so the theory that I use to try to describe this is I kind of just kind of summarize it in one slide here. So he does a better job explaining it in the paper than I can. But basically, if you do any sort of solid state 
physics, you see any of your wave functions, they have basically two parts. You have like a plane wave envelope, which is this green, these green lines here, and then you also have like a periodic part that goes through like your crystal structure. So if you imagine each of these blue boxes like a crystal lattice periodically, so this one is like a bulk material, so it just keeps going on forever. So you have your periodic function keeps going, and you have nodes where the wave function goes to zero. Then you have for your lowest except lowest energy state anyway, a very broad envelope function. And then he realized that if you take like a cluster, so if you just have like a finite system, that your envelope function basically just turns into your particle in a box solutions. So this phase factor here basically turns into a sine wave. And then you do your normal uh, particle, particle in a box solutions that would, a lot of us have probably done a couple of times. And you arrive at if the energy of your state is basically what its ground state would be, plus some confinement effects where your yeah, this is like the, what you'd normally see from a particle in a box solution, except he did it for spherical, so instead of a length, edge length, he used R. Can I add something? Mm -hmm. So your orange line is uh, expected to um, to show the the kind of block function or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To it be the same on each atom, right? The orange line is the same in the cluster and the. So it uh, just the um, so should the top pr pr present image of the orange line could be a little misleading because it is uh, um, slightly different. Yeah, it was just easier to draw it as period. But these the tops of each wave should approach <coughs> the top of the envelope function. So it is atomic functions. Yes. So it's like your molecular orbitals. Oh, yeah. So that's what the orange lines represent. So it's mm -hmm. like each crystallize here of your atoms, and then you get your molecular orbitals from there. And then, yeah, so this energy is just like the energy of uh, either your electron at the top of the conduction band or your hole at the top of, top of the valence band. And you get your band gap energy, which is... If it would be hole, then uh, minus instead of plus, right? Yes. And from those, you can get uh, an effective band gap or your new band gap for your confined system. So it's the band gap of the original plus your essentially confinement terms plus some higher order terms that pe people usually neglect when they model these systems. And so, just as a little exercise, we figured it'd be kind of a good idea to see if our, if we could uh, model the ground state structure of the prosaic quantum dots using just the simple part of our effective mass approximation. That's what this general theory is called. That was developed by Bruss back in the 80s. And probably other people too. So, so this slide is basically just a. Comparing the density of states for just some simple modeling using uh, basically using the envelope functions. So these are basically particle in a box. It looks like you're comparing DFT dose versus your uh, particle in the box uh, yes. dose, right? But, so but, but you have only one line on your uh, figure. What is your particle in the box dose? So this is the particle in the box dose. This one got trans... Oh, oh I see. So it's yeah. different figures. Whoa. Yeah, it got screwed and up. You <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's actually... You're showing them on different uh, on different figures. Yes. And actually, your x and y is also different now. <laughs> okay, it's better. Why not to show them together on one plot um, for easy comparison? I didn't get that far yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that looks better. 
And also, when you're calculating your, uh, your, your particle in a box, it's actually called effective mass approximation. Yes. Uh, approach. Uh, so you have this M star parameter here. Yes. Right? So where are you getting this uh, parameter and what is the meaning? I maybe missed it. Did, you, did he discuss it already? Uh, I guess they were part of the last slide. I didn't go into them in the detail. So basically. I mean, I can wait till your last slide. <laughs> I just can hold my question. But I mean, I mean last, last slide last is in the previous, previous, oh. previous slide. But basically, so the effective mass basically comes from like the curvature of the conduction band. Like that's just the technical way about it. But basically, you can relate the band structure to an effective mass. But have you done it by yourself? So you no, took it from your DFT calculations? So where did you get it? Like these are calculated from literature. Hmm. People calculated or from experimental data? Because people can measure this right. from effective mass. I mean, effective mass can be measured. I think I pulled it from a calculated one. But yeah. it's for, for the bulk materials. For the bulk perovskites. Yeah, most of that. I can't remember the technical details, but I just pulled it from a calculation that somebody did in another paper. <laughs> just for for exactly the same system, right? Yeah, same. Chemical, atomic chemical, atomic. chemical composition. Yeah, I think. But recheck. I, th I think. I think it's probably based on the bulk materials. Mm -hmm. uh, I think on the bulk force. If electron effective mass, I think, was a little bigger than one, I think the hole is a little less than one. Which. Yeah, I think that checks out. Because usually, if you have a higher effective mass, you have lower density of states. So. Yeah, that was spit how it's plotted. So that's how it is here. Uh, no. Or is it the other way around? That's a okay, one. if you, if you, there are two things which again might be a little bit confusing, and this was also very related to Fatima's discussion. So we talk about density of state or we talk about band structure, and you see the difference, do you? If people say band structure, what is it? Oh, what you will show, it, yeah, what you will be your x and y on your uh, figure? Energy and momentum. K vector, yes. Yeah. And those is just a number of states kind of thing. Say distribution plot, right? Number of states versus versus the energy. So um, then, if you go to the band structure, and probably you need to do, is it possible to do some drawing? You were doing it last time, right? So uh, and also, I think John was also showing some kind of pictures like this uh, in his presentation. So how you think this? Like we we thinking about parabolic structure for the for the band structure, right? How your energy changes with k. And this parabolic structure would be going down for the holes, like your parabolas will be pushed down, right? And parabolas will be pushed up for the electrons. Right? Mm -hmm. So you will have something like this picture. Right. And then the question is, if you call heavy hole or light hole, how this will be changing your kind of just schematically, how this will change your band structure? Well, I guess it's be better if you just write, uh, draw it. Oh, okay. Something like that, isn't it? That's and which is. one is which one? Your dash lines dash would be. That'd be the white hole. No. Well, you said it's proportional to the curvature. The heavier, the more curved it is. If what the right? constant in front is your value. So I guess light hole means it should be less curved or light. You can, you can look at from here, like if M, M is... Large number in the denominator small. means small total value. So the flat line is heavy particle and steep line is light particle. you give it a little bit of momentum, its energy should change more mm -hmm. if it's lighter. And now if you look on the uh, uh, energy, like now you kind of go in from this picture to your doors, means you kind of add in all your K values to one uh, doors. Which doors will be he having more peaks at the given range of energies? Those for your, how will say, less curved guys or for more curved guys? You mean at the edges? Is that what you're saying? 
Well, to get your doors, like getting from the band structure to the doors, you just take in your energies and uh, kind of sum over k, adding, adding, adding your energies at each k. I guess this is just for a single k or single. I understand, but but again, if it would be not a if it if it would be bulk material, and you're trying to really kind of talk in a language of bulk material with this one, so if it's a bulk material, right? So then the doors, how would be looking the doors? for these guys in case of very curved and less curved particles. Well, just look how many, how say, like, choose your energy range, right? And think how many of them will contribute for the less curved and more curved. Well, for your light, will you have larger spacing between states? Yes, and uh, heavier will be less. So it is denser, higher denser, denser. Right, so the heavier the mass, of your carrier, then your doors will have kind of a higher peak because your states will be more dense. And again, I, I don't mm -hmm. know, from, for me it's very easy to see from this graph because you really kind of choose. Let me take it. Maybe the pen. this dashed area, this is kind of your density of states at this small delta E, right? Mm -hmm. And clearly this uh, will be much more in a uncurved guy comparing to the curved guy, right? right? So then again, going back, the more denser, the heavier the carrier would be, right? It's a bigger number. Because heavier means it's less curved. Yes. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just wondering that, okay, mass is related to the curvature of a band, but density of a state is a number of bands in a certain but this is level. this is again, is it pr proportional or reverse proportional in the formula for the uh, mass and curvature? The larger the mass, the uh, flatter. Oh, the flatter. Flat. Yes. Yeah, but that will give us information about the shape of a starting But band. this is exactly what I was give, yeah. giving this figure. Yeah, but so I'm we have very different shapes here, mm -hmm. right? And again, the curved, which, which mass would be smaller, the dashed or the solid line? Yeah, I, I got this point, but I'm just wondering how is it related with the density of the state? Because this density is exactly of the, the answer for, the, for your question. Now, density of states will correspond to all k values, right? Like in this, in this crossed area, so because... Oh, okay. You're choosing a very small delta E, right? So it's all energies from this K, which I crossed, which I kind of, you know, put like a uh, crossed area, right? Oh, okay. Contribute. And definitely area under the curved guy is smaller comparing to the under, to the flatter guy. So which actually means that your density of state will be heavy, will be higher for, for uncurved, for heavier holes. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Not, the, not the density of a state at the starting k one, density of a state of overall all k one. Again, because technically, okay. if you have a single k point, you cannot define the effective mass, okay. right? I mean, yeah, I mean. <laughs> so, so that's why I said like it's really strange language here because this is a language of the bulk materials where you really have to include the many k points, the mm -hmm. momentum, because again, the free uh, so the electrons. <coughs> or carriers, holes, electrons in a bulk material in the solid state behave as almost like a free wave. And free wave is characterized by the, by the momentum, by the k-value. So that's why this language is completely appropriate for the solid state. It's really strange to, to apply now this language to molecules. Because the electrons in molecules, they behave as a plane wave, uh, they behave as a standing wave. Mm -hmm. And they're really very localized, actually. And it's, it's, it's definitely not depending on K at all, because it's not really dependence on K for the molecules, right? So, but quantum dots is kind of your artificial atoms, right? So you kind of really can can go in between molecule approach and the solid approach, the bulk approach. So please consider to make uh, comments on the stuff and then return to the author. 
if you want to suggest something. So, but technically we expect that the denser your density of states, the higher your peaks in the density of state, should correspond to the heavier carriers, either whole or electron. So a whole has the bigger mass then, because it has higher density states. Or denser states, higher peaks compared to the electron. But you need, of course, compare them at the specific energy range, right? If you just look at one, yeah, you probably, EV yeah, I would say like you probably will be looking something near the valence band, uh, near the ages of the valence and conduction band, near the band gap. Yeah, at least in this, near the band edges anyway, it's heavier, which is well, that's what the effective mass approximation is usually for. Okay. Anyway, so what what is the reason to compare this uh, particle in the box density of states and uh, DFT density of states? See what can be learned from it? See if reality is consistent. <laughs> in one sense, yeah, I guess you can also check to see. Um, whether the wave functions behave as you expect in DFT. So identify nature of the um, features in the DFT dose. Yeah, so you can see for the particle in the box, these are like, like S and P states. Right? Yeah, S and P states. So, so this is just like your your lobe just kind of circulated around mm -hmm. in all three directions. And then for your n equals two state, you get the node in the middle and you just do that across all three directions. So S and P orbitals. And if you, well, it's not very clear on this image. I could probably zoom in. But for the orbitals, you get both the features of the envelope function mm -hmm. and the molecular orbitals. So you get the high and low frequency. So just going back one slide. So what I was talking about is we're looking for these green waves, and then for the cone shab orbitals, you get the, the green waves plus the orange stuff. And one thing that I'm trying to do in the future is just uh, see if I can isolate the envelope functions for each part charge. Oh, you mean for DFT part? You want to, to see separate the envelope function for the DFT part? You can get the wave function, or the, not the wave function, the wavelength of the envelope but function. But again, uh, comparing the orbitals, if you're not looking just on the electronic levels, or not, not really on the doors, but comparing the orbitals, the symmetry is close to, to what you see or not? Uh, because it looks like yeah. the lowest occupied and the lowest unoccupied states in both cases should have like S type of symmetry, right? Yeah. During the level function. Yes. And again, it can be disturbed due to the presence of this block function behavior, right? But if you look on your DFT orbitals, do you think it's having this kind of shape more like S? Uh, or more like P? I think it's S for the near band. So does anyone remember how to zoom in on PowerPoint? Control plus? Or control scroll up, maybe? Control oh, plus. What? There you go. So for these wave functions, they kind of the edge lead atoms, so that's, those are the exposed surface. It's kind of hard to see, but they hybridize with the oxygen mm -hmm. key orbitals, so those are kind of like the end nodes, because you see those all around mm -hmm. in each X, Y, and Z. So the envelope function kind of goes from oxygen to oxygen across the So it's kind of, kind of spheri distorted spherical shape. Right. Yeah, because you only get it across the face, like the faces of the one, zero, zero, or zero, one, zero of all the crystal phases. So it seems to take a spherical shape. The LUMO is less... Uh, spherical. <laughs> yeah, less spherical. There's... It might be also, is... it might be, it also might be a signature of your some kind of, uh, um, maybe not really defect state, but maybe some kind of surface state, maybe. Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of on the light or le left side, I mean, bottom side rather than spread over the entire system, right? Yeah, but I've seen other people have computed orbitals for quantum dots that didn't have ligands attached to them. And some of them still have the same feature of like, yeah. of the loom only going across two of the bands. So it seems to be a, a consistent thing that shows up in these calculations. I don't know if they use VASP or not. But there are two things which you probably need to think about comparing these two models. So technically this model 
for, for, for the particle in a box model, three-dimensional box, right? It has, what about the potential size, the size, height? Potential height? Your box. Is, so it, fi is, is it finite, finite box or, in, infinite. or infinite box? Or finite box. Or infinite. I think you were swapping height, for infinite box. Uh, there are concepts of uh, box no. with infinite potential, well. Oh, yeah, so it would be, yeah, like basically infinite. Infinite. That's what we'd like. So it means, it means, and what we know for, from quantum mechanics, can, can you find the wave function outside the sizes of your box, if it's infinite box? If it's infinite, then, but, but in reality you can but leak here, out. And, and which means you expect no uh, any kind of appearance of your electronic clouds, electronic wave function, on ligands, if ligands not really involved into your uh, model, mm -hmm. right? If, I guess if your model is just the perovskite without really ligands on the surface. But, 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 but your DFT calculations, and just intuitively, of course we expect that electronic cloud should kind of be spread and not just be kind of find exactly in a in a inside inside the perovskite material right mm -hmm. so which means that in reality your box is a finite size box right. so first you probably th can think about that you need to correct this this solution to go to a little bit more uh, advanced not advanced i'll say a little bit heavy on mathematical part because solution for the finite box is slightly not as simple as for the infinite box. But first of all, you probably can play with the parameter of the height for your potential. Go to the finite size potential. So it means not, not like this, but with some, some size, which allows your tunneling of the wave function outside the box. Even if your energy is low than the potential. Mm -hmm. I think we kind of artificially account for that. We just, um, oh, the edge links aren't the same for each side, so you get no, no, it will not fix. The um, suggestion was to use solution fi finite, for the finite, box finite solution. depth or finite height of, of the of the wells, and uh, it doesn't need you immediately need to rush and do the calculations. But if you compare but and see any discrepancy, you can blame absence of the um, uh, finite but height of the wells. But you can just open books and see what would be the solution for the finite box, and of course the solution will depends very strongly on your potential, you or whatever you call it, mm -hmm. right? And the energy of the levels. Because, you know, like if it's higher, then we actually have a classical case. If it's low, then we have this tunneling. And then your wave function will be having an exponential uh, uh, kind of shape, right? Mm -hmm. And inside it will be kind of perturbed solution for the uh, infinite box solution. If I don't remember, I think it decays. Mostly it it decays exponentially oh, yeah, at like, the ages, right? Like five angstroms, I think it's mostly at least for the calculations I remember. Anyway, it was like five angstroms. That's where most of the density is like very low outside the box. But it probably should decay much slowly. Again, quicker, quicker, quicker not slower. Comparing to the infinite box? Five angstrom is a huge distance. Yeah. Uh, we, we have examples of the uh, DFT orbitals. But if you, low, if, you, if you put finite potential, right, so then your kind of shape of the wave function will be like this. Depending on the parameter of the, of the height, but if, right, you, if you match the depth of the box to the potential of this uh, DFT models, ah, uh, yeah. one, one should get approximately the same what is seen in DFT calculations. I agree, yes. Yes, and uh, five angstrom is really huge distance. Typically, the tails of the wave functions are shorter. It's one thing. The second thing is, what about symmetry? Is your box, like your actual uh, optimized structure, is it really exactly symmetric in terms it really looks like completely symmetric cubic box with sizes A, 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 wherever your size, five angstrom, five angstrom, five angstrom, or whatever the size of your box? Uh, not exactly. So, so then it means you have a perturbation due to the symmetry. So you're, you're not really having completely symmetric box, and probably angles of this box also not exactly 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. Right? That and again, mathematically it becomes not as simple, but this is another perturbation which will be definitely changing the solutions. Mm -hmm. That we accounted for. So L, that's... So we do L, X, L, Y, and L, Z. So we set it for each dimension. So you kind of see here, norm. if L, X, L, Y, and L, Z were the same, these three peaks would be basically the same, would be overlapping each other. But we offset them a little bit, so it gives a little bit of broadening.
-hmm. to the Gen 6 state. So it's, like it's mildly not it's exactly 90 degrees. Right. So usually <coughs> we have some angles, we be also perturbed. Mm -hmm. Maybe not exactly the same as in a straight box. So. And again, it's not that I'm saying, oh, solve it. It, it was, uh, the, there were some suggest ideas. suggestions how to interpret if the uh, models do not coincide, which possible mechanisms are responsible for discrepancy. Mm -hmm. So like you actually, initially, before even doing the, uh, kind of getting this comparison, you already can say immediately that they should not be exactly the same because of these two reasons, right? So the symmetry, uh, kind of more, less, how to say, symmetry perturbed, uh, structures com uh, comparing to, to the particle in a box which you consider, even if you don't have exactly the same sizes of your ABC boxes, right? So, so like angles might be also not, like in other words, might be not mm -hmm. exactly cubic structure or cubic cubic uh, box. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and, and, and the most important is of course your, your potential height. So it's actually finite box rather than infinite. Which allows the, the, the shapes of your wave function to penetrate and to tunneling through the size, which means you have non zero probability to find your electron outside the quantum dot on the ligands and maybe even on the solvent. Very small probability, like it's, yeah, whatever. whatever. And it depends on the energy which you are checking, right? So the higher the energy, if you go far and far away from your balance, uh, from your ages, right? So then, of course, you will have increase in the tunneling probability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I need to help me with that. He's got a script to look at. Pot car amplitudes, so. Mm -hmm. Or not pot car. Um, block pot. Block pot. Block pot. Block pot. Yeah. yeah. So this is it. where you can take these parameters if you want, and then probably figure out how to fix your model, and maybe then you will have much better comparison, much, much more um, exact values, I would say. Like mm -hmm. you, you will be in a better way to compare them directly, one against another. But even if you don't do the calculations, just kind of um, notes. ideas to, to explain why you're not expecting that this both model should be exactly identical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, yeah, I don't with this slide. And then, I guess that's about as far as I've gotten with it. And aside from the topics already discovered, the Particle in a box doesn't include spin orbit coupling, and I mean, I'll stop that. I'm not sure how to, you would include spin orbit coupling for particle in a box calculation. This was done uh, for the spherical box, for the quantum dots. Spin orbit coupling's fine structure calculations were done by Everest mm -hmm. in the 80s, but his shape of the box was uh, spherical, so which actually more complicated rather than regular box. Like the box. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll leave that for Everest then. Well, I guess he did already do it. Again, your spin orbit coupling is just included into the wave function. And then uh, you will have more, how say, just a portion for the wave function, which will kind of get some correction to your energy splitting mm -hmm. and uh, solution for your particle in the box in terms of energy. So it's like, I mean, again, mathematically, it's not as simple to do, but that is possible. It was done. Mm -hmm. I guess when I said I'm not sure how to do it, I meant like me physically. <laughs> It's like how to do it off the head or how to include it. But and your spin orbit couplings, again, if we look on this uh, band structure, right? Mm -hmm. So spin orbit couplings for the bulk material will be differently affecting the, sp the, the splitting between electronic levels for different case. Okay, yeah. They split the bands differently. Yeah. So, they get, so like, yeah. like in, in gamma point, you will have no splitting at all, for example, right? And they will be really more deviated in the other points, or, or they will be kind of, you know, <coughs> you might have a splitting in the gum point as well, but the shape of your parabolas will be different for different case. Mm -hmm. uh, I already guess how much I uh, talked about the envelope functions for the DFT model, and then trying to figure out a way to isolate those to compare to the particle in a box calculations. Where's the sensor for this thing? Must be up there. So that's ground state electronic structure. 
And then another thing that we do a lot in our group is calculate absorption spectra, so see if we can uh, match what's been done experimentally and see if we can figure out some uh, rules for the transitions that we do see or try to characterize some of the absorption peaks. So these are a couple of experimental spectra for the bromide-based quantum dots, which we are modeling. So this one's from the Notre Dame group that some of us met at ESP, if they were some of the people presenting this work. Uh, Brennan, they did the, the JAX paper. What's, what's the name? Uh, Michael Brennan. Oh, that was a student that was there. Okay. There's the Kuno group. Okay. That's a Kuno. Kuno. Yeah, that's from the Kuno group. And then this one was from some group in Belgium. I don't think I see, or Belgium. I never saw their name before, but. And the dash line is emission? Yeah, dash line is emission, black line is absorption spectra for different sizes of quantum dots. So, but again, your quantum dot size? Uh, 1.5. So it's. So it'd be. Twice less. Yeah, so we expect more comparisons to something like this or the bottom one over here, although I'm not sure what size that is. But basically, you should see more blue shifting and more. But you should see more distinct peaks like near the band edge. As you become more quantized, you should see it. Because of the S, S and P uh, harmonics of, of an envelope mm -hmm. function. Yeah, they'll be more overlap, so they'll be more enhanced. And. So, so what is exit on the radio size for these materials where you really expect? You know, this is a parameter which people mm -hmm. use to say where you really should have the confinement effect being significant. It means you really can see this. Yeah, for this one, it's meeting in levels seven, eight nanometers, and you kind of see it here. So eleven, ten, nine is shifts. So it means if I go to twelve, thirteen, and so on uh, size, then the spectra will be not really shifting and changes after that, right? Right. After 12 nanometers, I should not, I, I expect no really significant changes to the spectra should be noticed, mm -hmm. either in energy or in the shape. Yeah, they should all be emitting around 510, 520 for, for anything above like 10 nanometers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to continue our particle in the box modeling, we try to see if it would be possible to model spectra just from a simple model from particle in a box. So the first initial thought that we thought of was using the energy density states. So basically what that is, is if you just consider a transition and then just count, like bin that into a histogram. So you just account for all possible transitions and that they're all equally likely within a certain energy range. And you just plot them and give them a little broadening for spectra. And that's what this chart is here. So so this energy here would be like the homo lumo transition. So here you're not really looking on the transition density values, right? Right, this is it just is looking at- Bright or dark, it's all possible excitons all which possible you can excitons. make. Mm -hmm. Within a certain energy range. So here would be from <coughs> three to four nanometers. But it's interesting that you already have this kind of uh, shape structure and some kind of features, mm -hmm. right? Even if you're not applying the, uh, how it calls, uh, the selection rules, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of will be will be probably making it even more shapey <laughs> structurized <laughs> structurized yeah <laughs> so the source of these features are uh, quantization between yeah. levels yeah so you can see this transition here is from basically the lowest hole in electron state so your n equals one for so you need how many quantum, quantum numbers do you need to identify a single transition so six for each transition for this model so then the second layer transitions six that would be quantum numbers? So oh, three for electron, three for hole. Right. So three for each carrier. Yes. So X, Y, Z, because that's how we set yeah, up the yeah, model. So it is basically what what you are writing here. Yeah. So that's what these numbers represent. So this would be. Uh, so one one two to one one one. Energy and basically just keep repeating that pattern for up to the third state, I think. It's just one no, so these are these and again, are probably it would be interesting to compare the same information with the DFT spectra, like if you just look on all possible transitions. Mm -hmm. And then that, well, I did do that, and it turned sideways on here. Oh, it 
is because of transition between Mac and PC. So it's revenge of Microsoft. <laughs> I guess I don't know if this will eat, what you meant by comparing. You meant DFT EDOS to particle EDOS? Uh huh. So I guess this is comparing DFT spectra with DFT EDOS. Uh, well, oh, what, if, if the lines are transparent, you can align them and show uh -huh, them. Oh, yeah. So, 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 like this top guy, I mean, the insert, this is the real spectra, including the selection rules including the transition uh, from BFT, yes mm -hmm. so that's the red curve and, then the and, and on a you put it on a top of the just all possible transitions right yes so it's just counting all possible transitions from uh -huh. and for your all possible transitions you already don't have such a discrete spectra as it was for the particle in the box right right so you see the lowest transition only has like only a couple of counts and then the higher in energy you go the more states that you have so it basically but interestingly, um, these peaks, would they, like those peaks after you really kind of calculate the transition dipoles, right? Do they correlate with those features in your all possible uh, states from particle in the box? You're talking about my red curve with this one? Versus this one, because it looks like you also have mm -hmm. peaks which probably, again, energies might be different because we know you're, you're not getting exactly the same energies. But, but the splitting between these states probably is comparable to what you see in your particle in the box. E Maybe. Yeah, I think. I guess I was in a rush when I put this together, so I didn't put it on here. But you could see, well, just comparing this image to this image, you see one, two, three peaks mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, within one EV. And then, I guess this is. A little bit less. Two, two and a half EV. Mm -hmm, but you still see many of the same features. Mm -hmm. show up and so and another thing I noticed is this plot on the right is basically the oscillator strength versus transition energy for the DFT well, calculations. This, uh, uh, does this feeding take care of all uh, transitions or only brightest ones it looks like a very repeatable trend they all go into uh, on a line <laughs> yeah, so this is a log plot. So, so basically, this, so this here is like the lowest en energy of Paul mm -hmm. and then the higher the energy you go, the oscillator strength decreases pretty exponentially. Mm -hmm. So your y-axis is your home, uh, the energy of excitation, right? Y is oscillator strength mm -hmm. on a y log is scale, and, and x is your energy difference, uh, the energy of the exciton, right? Yes. And so that's how this purple figure turns into this red one. So the higher in energy you go, your transition probability becomes exponentially less. So you have, but you have a lot more transitions. So, so your features are more resolved with each other than compared with EDOS. Interesting. So. I thought that was just an interesting thing because I think EDOS is pretty comparable to like a bulk absorption because since it seems since you have such finely spaced uh, energy states a lot of them overlap with each other so most transitions are equally probable in a rough mm -hmm. sense <coughs> but when you go to confinement that trend decreases your lowest energy ones become higher and your higher energy transitions become much less likely And I think I just have one more slide on this top. Uh, instead of feeling, we can all just <laughs> turn us. Okay. Just tell us what so is the main point for showing this slide, uh, for comparing these uh, features. So this was just uh, the DFT computed transitions. So, and then the, basically the question marks were atop each feature, like where they oh, arise oh, from. Oh, here is your spin orbit coupling now. Yes, so spin orbit spectra. It's basically what I did. Oh, Jesus. So you can avoid it in the future by. Uh, I don't know. 
I guess it's usually it's not continuous. Copy, copy pasting uh, images as uh, bitmap. Or just putting it in PDF format. If you don't have any features for PowerPoint, you can use PDF format for slide presentation. I guess it's probably take too much time to rearrange it. So basically, it's just a plot. But we, we do have printouts with uh, kind of sketch. Of it's just partial density states and then it marks each uh, like prominent feature or each mm -hmm. peak in the density of states. Mm -hmm. And then you can assign possible transitions from valence to conduction band. And then that would be a way to try to identify bright transitions and less bright transitions and characterize the, the how the spectra is generated that way. Mm -hmm. And what, what is the main message from, from this uh, assigning uh, of transitions to, to specific features? Uh, so you could determine possible selection rules or possibly Which rules? possible selection rules for transitions. Are there molecular Does selection rules? I don't know yet. I have what rules? For optical transitions. What what kind like what kind of rule is it? Like you're not you're not telling that you found the selection rules. Right. You're it's posing something to identify a goal that could go that, on the paper. Uh, this analysis may help you to identify possible selection rules. Yeah, so okay. between like Okay, states that are heavy. John is saying in Laporte selection rules. Or Which? Laporte, I don't know. Yeah, those and would be. Symmetry allowed transitions. Mm, well, yeah, that'd be something to try to identify. For, for the solution, for the spherical solution, where the solution of your wave functions just giving you pretty much similar to what you see in a hydrogen atom solution, right? Due to the spherical symmetry. So you get in a Bessel functions, which having this sp and so on shapes. And then selection rules will give you just SS transition, so it means you will have bright transition only between SS, PP, DD. You will have dark transitions from S to P or from D to P. Right. So you're kind of trying to... Try to identify those so features. To get, to get kind of the same ideas, right? So mm -hmm. like if you identify your orbitals in whatever shape you are showing from your slide with uh, particle in the box, you want to kind of based on the symmetry of these orbitals, you want to figure out what would be the selection rule. Yes, because a lot of people, they, a lot of people spend time identifying like atomic configurations of the orbitals, but nobody's, from what I've seen, has looked at. Envelope. Like, yeah, envelope functions are why, what possible transitions correspond to mm -hmm. the optical spectrum. So I figure that's a powerful tool we have, so might as well try and, to use and it. And could you, like you said, maybe not you said, but there was talk in a, uh, ESP conference, right, by Ephras, who was already applying this effective mass approximation to the perovskite's quantum dots, right? Mm -hmm. You remember this? I don't know whether he was already published, but because he was already reporting earlier than you, at least one month earlier, they probably already at least submitted the paper and it should be a that, one, that one's already out. Okay, good. So then can you just remind us what exactly, how, how your work on this part is different from what he was doing? or he has done already? Well, his is more theoretical. So he uses, well, I guess he uses like, <laughs> more theoretical models to generate, so he uses like cane. This probably is a disadvantage to your approach. If you say, oh, I'm less theoretical. <laughs> well, I guess we don't, we Because in other words, like, tell, tell I'm, about I'm yourself working, in, in more favorable ways. I'm more like a reviewer, right? So let's say I'm getting your, I'm assuming, I'm getting your paper as a reviewer, and then I'm seeing the paper of Ephraim, which I didn't read. I just can read the, the title and look on the figures, and they, if there would be a lot of kind of similar main ideas, then the question is, what's the reason to publish this work if pretty much the same things has, have been already addressed? And if you say because it's more theoretical, then it means it's more ad addressed more on a rigorous level rather than you are trying to address in it, right? So this is not the way to fight with reviewers. No, I know I got the answer for you now. So I guess in his model, he only considered like uh, homo lumo transitions, and he's looking at luminescence mm -hmm. mostly properties. Mm -hmm. So it was only a four-state model, basically, while okay. BFT, it's as many states. So they consider just really a few transitions 
yes. you extend it to much larger. But mm -hmm. do they also have ligands? The same ligands as you have in on your system, or they have different ligands? Um, I guess for their computations, I don't know what their model. Do was. they theory take any account of ligands? No. They and count you? for crystal structure. Yes. yes. So you are providing atomistic insight of the role of ligand, mm -hmm. yeah. which is missed in. So the you can now again, if you want to really put, uh, fr from my point of view, this is really probably can be as a separate paper rather than the paper where you put all these four things mm -hmm. together. Uh, but uh, here, you're, again, your main point is not that, oh, I applied this uh, effective mass approximation and I want to analyze the uh, selection rules or some, oh, kind of to obtain the selection rules. The main point is really to kind of compare the DFT calculations, which allows you to include in an atomic level, in a more realistic level, to include the surface effects, ligands, interaction with ligands, right? kind of all changes in a symmetry it's because it's not really a completely ideal box comparing to a very simple model which is which is of course very attractive to experimentalist the simple means you can solve like everyone can solve it very easily and get some kind of ideas based on the theory without really doing all these calculations mm -hmm. so your goal is really to compare and show the how say the role of ligands that they looks like they're probably really important you cannot just neglect them and again, okay. this means that this simple model might be really losing some some important things if ligands are not involved in this effective mass approximation. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not so easy to to get like like effective mass approximation really. I would say almost impossible. Like it's completely impossible to get ligands there on the same level as DFT allows you to do, right? And one way how you again you can play and thinking that you kind of have ligands is playing with the potential height. Right, because your ligands is providing this not infinitely large box, but a finite size box, and the size of your uh, potential, the height of your potential, can be kind of scaled or parameterized based on the uh, presence of, and this is what exactly you will do based on DFT, on the presence of ligands. Mm -hmm. Right? At least you can take account ligands on the level of this potential height. And then again, the question is how much this correction is really helping, or maybe even with this correction, your results will be still very, very different from, from your DFT calculations. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That might be relevant in a couple of slides, because I do but the, but the, different yeah, ligands. And I would suggest really go very, very carefully, because he's your competitor. I mean, mm -hmm. this paper, not he, but the paper. Right. Uh, against, against this paper, you like, it's, it's very easy for reviewers if they are in the field and they know about this uh, other paper, right? So because it sounds very similar, they immediately will ask, so what exactly in you? And if you're not really clearly represented in your, uh, in your text, right? And again, your figures in text and then as, as, as a big idea, so they will kill your <laughs> paper right away. <laughs> oh yeah, that's helpful. Again, it's not really finding selection rules or something. I would say it's really trying to focus on a role of surface, and specifically surface ligands, on these selection rules and comparing the simple model versus atomistic, uh, atomistic level model from DFT. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, yeah, I guess we already talked about those. And then, what what were, were they? Uh, oscillator strengths of the PDOS images from like one peak to another peak. Mm -hmm. So just identifying those oscillator strengths, uh, seeing which ones are bright, which ones are dark, and then identifying certain reasons whether they're ligands or whatever, what other atomistic mm -hmm. reason mm -hmm. for those rules or for those trends, and then also maybe selection rules for particle in a box because this is from a picture paper from Dimitri from a while ago, and then they did some modeling where they approximated their thin film. That's what the model was. Mr. Dimitri? Mr. Dimitri. <laughs> the Dimitri. So they're doing with a thin film, so they considered one dimension as an envelope function, and then did some calculations of the transition dipole from the associated wave functions, and found some trends, but I don't know if that would be worth exploring for our system, because it seems well, we'd have another two dimensions we have to quantize. But then you just repeat the same equation for each Three dimension. Times. yeah. Very simple. 
Yeah, I guess because this is X, and Y, and Z, and not radial. And cross as well, right? Yeah. With so, uh, so uh, you could line. apply this uh, equation for making not the you just need another sum edos, but actual absorption mm -hmm. spectrum based on particle in the box. You just will have uh, additional uh, sums with respect to x, y, and z uh, mm -hmm. n values, like, like your quantum numbers values, right? So <coughs> means you just copy and paste this two times with so some different two three times some three, three directions each. Well, this is for one direction. Uh, well, yeah. So then another two. But you will have sum over all three directions, right? Will mm -hmm. be right. inside each direction and also cross terms, also by the possible, like, and from mm -hmm. E and X to E and Y, right? Mm -hmm. uh, e electron and X to the E hole and Y. This cross terms also probably might give you not zero mm -hmm. asymmetric strengths. Start with three and then go up from there. <laughs> if it doesn't look nice. So, yeah, p possible future work for absorption spectra. So then, structure to property relations for ligands. So this is just kind of an overview of something I'm doing for the hobby group, or something that I might include for that paper. So, density states are turned sideways. But basically, we're comparing like a fully passivated quantum dot, remove one ligand, see the absorption band structure, and then compare that to a replaced ligand. So this one is the fully passivated dot, and as if you look up and down, there's this is like a healthy band structure or healthy uh, density state structure. So there's no trap states in, on the inside of these. And you can see the orbitals; they look pretty he healthy for the most part. This one looks a little funny, but you can ignore that for later. But you don't have charge density away from the core. Right. So it's all inside. Part of sky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's all inside. So it's. Aaron, before you go forward, can can you quickly remind us about the charge balancing? Are your models mm. charged neutral, or you artificially charge them, and how? It's does neutral it because it's balanced by ligands, right? Positively charged and negatively charged ligands. Um. It's. Or is we minimize it as much as we could, so it's a plus two overall charge. Oh, so, so, it's, it's so this one is, charge. Yeah, so it has a plus two charge. What would happen to the dose if you do not do this plus two? How would dose would change? Means so you take you the same system and not put in the charge. Right. So, if, like, if you just let DFT calculate it, or mm -hmm. count probably all the electrons, you just get a couple. Like these bands would be filled. Okay. A couple. So if you do like red no field, band. red field area mm -hmm. in the bottom of the conduction band. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, means you will have no really band gap problems. Yeah, so it'd be like P-dope, like what okay. Daniel has been talking about previously. And but why um, why actually 2 plus? Like, is it possible to really get rid of this 2 plus by the ligands to balance it completely to neutral system? Mm -hmm. Is you it dealing with, uh, like, it's really because of the symmetry, I don't know, size, if you make it larger, then you probably can, can really make it neutral, or? Then you need to add or remove ligands, <coughs> and then if you lose the, the symmetry, then yeah, so one, one side will be more preferred than another one. You, you cannot remove uh, two ligands. So because of, yes? Oh yeah, just what he was saying, basically. So if you remove any of the ligands, you'll have an asymmetry of ligand distribution on one side, so with the plus two, you have but they might like again. You take one ligand, your charge becoming zero, neutral, right? So of course the geometry will be changed, and the ligand, even if you take in the ligand from some of lat or whatever sides, right? So the other guys, the neighbors, might be kind of redistribute themselves to 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 kind of minimize this uh, loss of the ligand, and mm -hmm. maybe maybe reorganization happens in a way that. Each you will be not really seeing a very distinct mm -hmm. side without ligand. It is expected that you will see, well, it is interesting to explore, but, but you each, each, sur each surface lead, transition metal ion, needs to be coordinated to experience correct uh, octahedral coordination. But if the question you remove is one ligand, it immediately will create, uh, it's not only the total charge, it will uh, create under coordinated uh, metal ion that will experience different crystal field splitting and the uh, but then you can take will, one lead oh. or one what <laughs> no the gap will close immediately uh, structure will be screwed up substantially 
but you have played with it like you have tried different configurations to see like like this this knowledge is really coming from your uh, from your how to say practical knowledge on playing with this uh, ligands and looking on the electronic levels the electronic level is a little bit that I haven't looked too closely at like nuclear reorganization I just come for the energies but I don't look at the structure I haven't looked at them in detail very much yet so but in experiments like you do in experiments uh, can you detect whether your quantum dots are charged or not is it like like is it really reasonable to assume uh, that they have a charge if you could isolate the defects it would be possible I think I was just looking at one paper recently they used ion coupled spectroscopy and they could find defects that way by defects do you mean like lead defects or like defects no no I'm not, not defects I'm saying like in your case you don't have any defects right now right, right. You have, but you have two plus charge. Yes. So my question is, can you detect experimentally whether your system is neutral or charged? If you're, there are sophisticated ways to do it, but we don't have access to those in the hobby lab. So you have to isolate uh, you, the you, defects. You too. can't do it. Right. But it's have have other people tried at least? Not for perovskites. I saw they did one paper for cat selenide, but it's we have to find a way to isolate the defected quantum dots from the from like the whole ensemble, which is an idea of it actually trying so to So in other it. words, no one really knows whether the right. system's really charged or not charged. But they do know, like based on size, like the stoichiometry. And for smaller particles, it's lead heavy or lead bromine. So this is the right lead surface. Enhanced. You have more lead? Yeah, so it's a, a structure. So we have exposed lead and bromine instead of the other possible surface termination. So it is what Daniel was doing, right? Yeah, he was terminating Ex the uh, different Exposing uh, different surfaces, lead rich or uh, cesium rich. Yeah. If you have a surface like this, you would need the ligands to cap it. So. So yeah, so two plus full passivation ligands. And what I did is so I took I removed one of the anion ligands from the lead, so it's kind of hard to see, but you kind of see from the orbital. Normally there'd be a, an acetic ion here, but I removed it. You can see that the p orbitals of the lead is exposed, so it's like a shallow surface state. If you look at the density of states for spin restricted, you can kind of see it at the band edge. It sticks out a little bit past zero, where compared to... Oh. And just again, go back to your charge question. So when you remove one and I in ligand, it means you still having a plus one charge, right? It was plus two before, now taking one and your N I in ligand yes. has minus so one I, charge. Yeah, so now it's plus one. So I change the charge whenever I So anytime you play with ligands, you automatically adjust charge to By have one. the um, gap opened and avoid effect of P doping or N doping. Yes. Okay. I would assume that the ligand leaves is going to take its charge with so it. So probably your uh, thinking was that if on experiment there was a distribution of different, uh, differently charged or differently ligated dots, only those that have correct stoichiometry of ligands and charges would uh, flash light and others will stay dark and you will not notice their signals. Not in those words, but yes. Okay. <laughs> It would have an open gap. That's as far as I went. But and I have a here. question to John. Uh, I don't know. We discussed that you kind of noticed uh, about the charge on this quantum dot with a die from Pung. That there were some kind of issues that he didn't really probably assign the charge correctly. Have you have you already looked? Like, did you try to play with the charge and see whether? your density of states really very affected and you see this appearance or disappearance of states inside the gap due to the you having know, minus charge or not having minus charge? Yeah, so I actually have, um, oh, can Show you? by sign the language. <laughs> <laughs> he said yes, you know. If, if it is yes or no, it is enough. If you need to have longer discussion, it is. Yes means if you, if you make it neutral instead, like if it's supposed to be negatively charged, oh, if it's supposed to be negatively charged, but you make it neutral, then the, the, the band gap is closing and we have pretty much the same story as uh, 
Eric, uh, sorry, Erin was uh, discussed with his charges. Yes? You can tell now something. Now we can hear you. Uh, oh, you can hear me? Okay. Um, so, yes, I played around with uh, some of the charging, and at a certain point, the gap actually opens back up with um, the quantum dots. So instead of having, you know, partial occupations right next to some type of unoccupied, you, you have an open gap with just a very partial, like, non-filled orbital right at the edge of the valence band. Okay, so then it's very similar to what was discussed with with this perovskite uh, business, right? Mm -hmm. It looks like if we incorrectly, if we really charge in the system, uh, either kind of putting the negatively charged ligand, but putting it zero means not really assigning the correct charge, then we immediately see this kind of PN type of uh, PN, PN uh, doping states inside the gap, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, John, you will go off uh, sound fine. <laughs> so, yes, for, so when I remove the anion ligand to expose the light surface, it seems there's a shallow trap state that kind of pops out, but I would need a partial density state to totally confirm that. It could just be for me. Um, Fermi leveling or redistribution of charges moving states around. But, and I was <coughs> planning on doing a sort of spectra for these two to see what the effect is on the spectra. Can you quickly uh, remind us what is the chemical composition? Just show uh, which groups, which ions. Some of attendees of the room were asking other cesium ions and where they are. Um, cesium would be hiding behind this ligand here, so we go look straight forward. But your orbitals not really sitting on the cesium, they mainly right. coming from lead and bromine, yes. right? Near the band edge. Uh, yeah, near the core. Open so, yeah. so yeah, so bromine, or not bromine, cesium, they're at the center of the cages, or the unit cells. Mm -hmm. And then the pink, if you can resolve them, are the bromines, and then like these little gray features, those are the lead, and those are at the corners and along the face of the Quantum dot. Okay. And then, yeah, these are just the ligands binding to the blood states. And so one thing we did, I, I did do with the hobby group, is we followed a reported procedure from a Jack's paper. So they basically just took some thiocyanate salts, so like sodium thiocyanate or potassium thiocyanate, and they just put it in the parent solution of the proskite, and after about 20 minutes they saw pretty much near unity photoluminescence. So that kind of indicated that, the, that those ligands were enhancing the features of the proskite quantum dot somehow. Either they were covering surface trap states, or I think in their paper they, they didn't see any spectral characterizations from IR of uh, like these lead sulfur bonds on the surface. So they hypothesized that the that the ligands um, like removed any excess leads somehow, which I don't know. That didn't really make sense to me. But, so it's kind of unknown how this ligand attaches to the surface, or how it, or what its role is on proskite quantum dot surfaces. It's been relatively unexplored. So this is something I was going to throw in for the work we've been doing there, and you can kind of see. So it binds. So the sulfur binds to the positive lead ion because the sulfur has the negative charge on it. And it kind of binds in a, kind of like 20 degrees. Mm -hmm. Like it, this was your zero, so about 20 degrees. And it has some, it seems like it's doing some sort of hydrogen bonding mm -hmm. interacting with, with the ligands. With the amine ligands anyway. Oh. So just some preliminary orbitals from these. So from the density states, it's, you don't see any obvious trap states. Again, I would have to look at PDOS to see what exactly they are, but at the HOMO, you can kind of see something interesting, see an interesting feature. So it seems like the ligand actually hybridizes with it, and then the orbitals stick out with the ligand. So it's kind of like a conductive type. So. And, and again, you took out the ligand, or what? Or replaced, ligand exchange. 
Well, what do you so, think so ligand exchange. So oh, just one ligand was changed. Yeah, so right? here we removed one of these carboxylic anion, carboxyl anions. To which isocyanides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, it's, but but it's all it's it's each of them removed or it's just single ligand was changed. Just a single one. Okay. So I tried to make the rest of it transparent, and then this one will stand out. Probably not obvious, but so this is the region where the ligand binds to the lead surface. And if you look at the PDOS, you can see that the ligand hybridizes the homo orbitals and actually draws some electron density towards the surface. Because normally before all the electron density would just be on the inside, but it kind of brings them to that side as well and pulls it away from the other side. So it seems to have a passivating effect, but also some sort of dipole effect too on the surface. And in the paper that we were following, they noted they saw a consistent, like, I guess it'd be a five nanometer blue shift in their spectrum. And is I they, they switching and they substitute the ligands? Mm -hmm, yeah, after they do the treatment. And I guess just from the density of states, like, I haven't done the calculation yet, but it doesn't seem like it changed that drastically. So, But because you have only a single ligand, yeah, that if you change all carboxylate groups to, to the isocyanate, you probably will see mm -hmm. much more significant change. I think in that period they noted there was like a saturation point, so they'd see like a certain amount of ligands attach, and then after like the initial 20 minutes there would be no more like passivation. So it seemed to be limited by some sort of either surface states or some sort of equilibrium within the solution. Concentrations. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah, so just some preliminary work from that group, but then also future possible work is all sorts of other possible ligand uh, possibilities for these systems, I guess. Silver complexes have been used in like cat selenide, so it was a natural selection to try those as passivating prostate quantum dots, and then other groups have attached either um, like cold transfer, electron transfer ligands to the surface, so those could be possible, or just ideas like those that we can uh, work with the hobby group to have experimental and computational insight into passivating and improving photolumin photoluminescence properties of these quantum dots. And then I have the last section, excited state dynamics. And what time is it even? You have generally 13 minutes. Very nice. So for 25% of your I will say you have 10 minutes. <laughs> sure. Um, but I think so the last part we probably have seen already when well, you were well, it, it is on the poster, uh, right? No, I, I, we understand it's the most important part. And it is important to practice, to verbalize it right now. No, but how logical it is I would say connected. because we suppose that people here, it's not our first time hearing about the things, hopefully you can go really very quickly. We can hope, because some of these are also slides we've seen before. There's I know some of these are Dimitri slides. He's kind of he's presented a couple of meetings ago. So just an overview for the section. So we do excited state dynamics and spinner basis. So that's what the first slide kind of is going to show when I get to it. And then hot carrier cooling in the systems. We calculate the photoluminescence quantum yields from the non-radiative and radiative rates. And then I uh, just a comment on something I've been looking at from the EFROS paper that was brought up previously about uh, the character of the luminescence transitions in these systems. So for a lot of systems that we work with, they're closed shell. So each state is doubly, or twice degenerate, doubly occupied. So LUMO plus two to LUMO plus one and LUMO, it's, they're basically the same transitions that are suited twice from the vast calculations. And then we can go into open shell configurations where you have spin polarized, so your up and down electrons can have different energies, but your transitions are only going to be between same spins. So if you have a spin alpha LUMO and it's non radiative relaxing, relaxing, it's only going to go to other alpha states. And then same with beta. And then you could do the same thing with optical transitions, but you just have HOMO down here up to LUMO, both systems. And then what we included for excited state dynamics is you can go to non-collinear spin calculation. So basically, your 
Oh, in a lot of situations, anyway, your LUMO, alpha, and LUMO beta states aren't going to change in energy that much when you include non-collinear spin. If you include spin over coupling, they affect them a little bit. But non-collinear spin, they're not going to change, but you can get additional uh, pathways for transition. So you could have a LUMO plus 5 to LUMO plus 4 in a situation where you wouldn't be able to get that in a spin polarized. <coughs> and so the take-home message is you just have a lot more work to do when you do. <laughs> Not coming your calculations. And yeah, this is basically the same slide as previously, except just showing it in a different format. So this is like a matrix format of the possible transitions. So they're all nicely color coordinated. So how to read it? So So we have different possible transitions which are associated with these. So it is your way to interpret uh, triple R matrix for the non-collinear case. E yes. Okay. That would be one way to interpret it anyway. So your diagonal elements are always going to be zero because that would be like you're transitioning to yourself. But this this doesn't include the information on the on the uh, oscillator strengths in this transition. Right, this Your is just a general. It's non, non radi radiative. So yeah, oh, this, oh, this be, is non radiative. So this is non radiative. So this would be, yeah, this would be like an RR file, mm -hmm. and then each of these would be like a magnitude of the likelihood of the transition from LUMO plus three to LUMO and so forth. And the color codes just show what type of transition they are. So if you're a blue block, that would be spin conserving or like alpha to alpha. Your pink block. To be a beta to beta, so we have LUMO four, LUMO to plus two. Uh, spin forbidden, that'd be like a LUMO plus three to LUMO, or any odd indice to an even indice, basically. What does it mean, degenerate? Spin forbidden. The yellow. Oh, so I guess for our system, for the, if you include spin over coupling, the, you always get two degenerate states near the band edge. So your LUMO and LUMO but, plus one are in this is without spin orbit. Yes, it is uh, so non-collinear non spin, yet without spin orbit. Yes, so if you wanted that transition, you'd have to include spin orbit. So then it would just become a different color block. Or we just name it differently. We would say spin orbit coupling transition, or spin flip transition. And you can probably tell from this characteristic headline, this isn't my slide either, but uh, same information that I wanted to describe. So basically what we're trying to, well, one thing we're trying to model is hot carrier cooling in the system. So this would represent uh, an optical absorption transition from some valence band state to the conduction band. And then these little blue lines, they, just, they represent uh, possible states in the conduction band, and this is going in time. So in time, this jumps down due to coupling with phonon interactions, or dissipating energy. So it eventually transitions to the uh, band edge, and you can either recombine either radiatively or non-radiatively. And so this is the technical jargon of how we compute non-radiative transition rates for carrier cooling. So these Vs are our non-adiabatic couplings, which we compute on the fly. So coupling at one time, later in time, then take an autocorrelation of it. And if you take the Fourier transform, you can get uh, transition rates between states due to phonon electron coupling, which is diagrammed here in this red field tensor. So this axis and this axis represent orbital states, and then the Z axis or the tall axis represents uh, rates of transitions. So the higher the peak, the faster the rate goes. And some interesting features for this state is for, so yes, it's generally known for systems of this crystal structure that the conduction and valence band edge are going to be twice degenerate in energy. So we see this uh, 
oscillating feature going high, low, high, low, high, low. So these high features would be transitions between states of the same energy or degenerate states. And then these off diagonal elements, which are lower in intensity, represent uh, cooling to the band edge or rates of transitions from homo minus x to homo minus y or so forth. So which um, of these transitions would correspond to yellow uh, degenerate transitions on your diagram a couple of slides ago? Oh, that would be these. Okay. The top peaks would be uh -huh. the degenerate okay. features. And then any states that are like one apart from each other would be like a spin flip transition, and two apart would be like a spin conserving transition. I just question: Would it be possible? Would it be possible to encode those into the tensor, or what? would it be too like to code in like the specific types of transitions, like by color, kind of like how you outlined in the matrix? Possibly. Might get a little too, or it might be too much for one slide. But anyway, just an idea I had, and so. Yeah, these represent rates of transitions between orbitals due to non-radiative or electron phonon coupling in the systems. And so to, to use these red field tensors, we start off with an initial condition, which we choose based on oscillator strengths, the most probable excitations in the system, or ones we think are interesting anyway for initial conditions. So here we start out with LUMO plus 9, or HOMO minus 9, to LUMO plus 10, where in these figures, the green represents like a, a reference energy density. So basically no change in uh, energy in time. The yellow line represents changes in electron density, or occupations in time, and these blue represent uh, increases in hole density in time. And then the dashed lines just represent energy expectation values. And this is on a log time, so negative 3 would be 1 femtosecond, and then 0 would be 1 picosecond. You can extrapolate the time scale that way. And so for these systems, we see that the hot carrier cooling occurs in the sub-picosecond range. So above 100 femtoseconds, but uh, below 1 picosecond, basically. And so these are the computer rates that we have, and if you turn those into time scales, I think this is like 120 picoseconds, and this is like 250 picoseconds. One over four, right? Mm -hmm. So it'd be 0.2 picoseconds, or 200 femtoseconds. That's what okay. I meant to say, not picoseconds, but femtoseconds. And so I didn't put them on this slide, but experimentally they see, or the reports I've seen anyway, is that hot carrier cooling usually occurs, it's on sub picosecond time scales, but it's more in the range of like 500, mm -hmm. 400 to 500 femtoseconds. And I don't know, variations in that could just be due to our model size, since it's smaller, we have more ligand interactions than uh, what you'd see experimentally. And yeah, I'm just not sure. Because the di different surface to volume ratio in the small models, the whole model is almost a surface and therefore effect of ligands is stronger and it facilitates more pumping energy. energy. Yeah, there's more electron density than what would physically be there on the surface. Okay. And but we're on the right time scale, which is usually a good sign for models of these sizes. And so so these are images of energy relaxation. The previous slide showed energy relaxation in time, and this figure shows uh, spatial uh, relaxation of hot carriers in time. So these lines represent uh, ISO surfaces projected uh, as a 2D slice of the Prescott quantum dot, and then orange represents a gain in electron density, and blue represents gain in hole density, similar to the previous model. And I don't know, it's kind of cool to see, so I'm just going to run it. And one other idea I had, so for the counters on here, it would be possible to include a magnetization readout, right? 
That would be something handy to know. So as you can see, as the electron relaxes to the band edge, the, the P states become more occupied, so that's what these orbitals are. So this is like a P state for the for the lead atoms, and then these must be P states for the bromine atom, which is behind the lead atom. So the only the correct atom is the center one, because it is the one of the bulk mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or it's the most easily to visualize anyway. And and so along our excited state trajectory, it's uh, we can compute the photoluminescence of this material if we just consider the oscillator strength of transitions while the while the electron and the hole are at a certain occupied state and time. So, so this figure here would be like a time result photoluminescence. So you can see very early trajectory, there's low energy heat dissipation that competes with non-radiative relaxation. So it's just basically like IR heat that's giving off. And then once it fully relaxes to the bandage, you see that it gives a very bright, intense PL. So the scale is off this year. I think the count is up towards like 10 to the 6 reference and I guess that doesn't really make sense by itself you need something to reference it to but we'll work on that in the future and just to go along with this we have so we have our radiative relaxation rates and we have our non-radiative relaxation rates so we compute a photoluminescence quantum yield of this system just using the conventional KR divided by KR plus KNR relaxation so from the red from the red field tensor, the non-radiative relaxation rate across the gap is 1.18 nanoseconds, and then the computed uh, radiative relaxation is 2.35 nanoseconds. So they're roughly on the same same time scale. And if you do the calculations, you get a photoluminescence quantum yield of around 33%, which is well generally low for these systems. It'd be good for pretty much anything else, but usually for if you have a fully passivated quantum value, you'd expect near unity photoluminescence from these systems. Mm -hmm. When it's not blinking and other stuff, that's a different topic. So comparing this to experiments, from what I remember, for room temperature measurements, the lifetime is on the nanosecond time scale, usually a little above. I've seen things from like one to four nanoseconds mm -hmm. for room temperature. If you go to like super cool conditions or like two Kelvin measurements, they actually go to like picosecond relaxation rates, which is like 250 picoseconds. Radiative. Radiative, yeah. Which is interesting in itself. But we did these calculations for room temperature, or roughly room temperature. So these correspond pretty well, I think. I can't remember the non or the non-radiative relaxation rates, but uh, just from the physics, they're probably a little bit high because we don't include uh, any sort of correction for the Rashba effect, which has been a popular um, theory, which is which explains why the non-radiative relaxation is suppressed in these systems. And if you're not familiar with the Rashba effect, is I'll just draw a little diagram. So basically. So from earlier, really, this is like what you expect for a typical band structure for any materials. But if you have spin orbit coupling with, um, I can't remember what the technical term is, but any sort of like crystalline defect or asymmetry within the crystal, you can get uh, spin splitting of these bands. So it would look more something like. Then momentum dependent is spin. Yeah, so it's so your 
So normally you just have one minima for your potential, for your dispersion curve. But when you include the Rashba effect, you get two minimas, which are spin dependent. So you would need some sort of phonon to assist the radiative relaxation a little bit to, to do the spin flip. Or do the spin conserving transition. So experimentally, it's been shown under well, extreme conditions that there is a small Rashba effect for quantum dots. So it slow down uh, non radiative relaxation just a little bit to these systems. And you told that this uh, quantum mute number is the main result of the of your research, or um, I'm not sure. I guess I guess we would like to say that it's we would like to improve the quantum mute or improve either. I guess I don't know what I mean by the word improve because we have a fully passivated quantum dot, so we want to improve our modeling the system so that we can get correct okay. yields for the system. And then this right figure on the bottom is just something I threw in. So this is molecular dynamics photoluminescence. You once presented on it a couple of times. I think John was the first one to publish on it. So basically from your molecular dynamics trajectory you just uh, Compute oscillator strengths in time. So, as a so if you're in your potential energy well, like as you slosh back and forth, you have a probability of emitting at a certain time. So, at the tails, you have a lower probability of emitting a photon. While when you're at equilibrium distance, you have a higher probability. So it's a way to try to get line widths of a uh, of PL in these systems. The green curve is experimentally, I think. I get pulled that from measurements I did in the hobby group. And then the red line is what we computed from our molecular dynamics trajectory at room temperature. So they are being in a good agreement. Yeah, it's uh, they're in pretty good agreement. It's a little broad. So I think one explanation I've heard thrown around is that like the temperature on VASP or for your molecular dynamics trajectory doesn't necessarily correspond to like physical real temperatures. I haven't looked into the paper. I think Dimitri referenced the paper. There is uh, Maria Fernanda Sierra from uh, uh, City University of New York, New York and she found that uh, one needs to um, like in order to model 300 Kelvin in reality you need to run simulations at uh, 250 in uh, uh, DFT if you use but but this scaling depends on the function so it, it is for PB. But, but our temperature is actually defined in best cases probably plus minus 20 or even 30 kelvins, right? So it means you really not having temperature of 300, you have well, a temperature between 350. Are, are, it's not very helpful to compare absolute numbers. If one would check trends how the line width uh, would change um, as a function of temperature, then it may show uh, right trends as uh, John was doing in 2016, right? Do those correspond to more like realistic non-adiabatic couplings? No, no, no it, it, for in DPL you do not need non-adiabatic couplings. You need just sampling of the oscillator strengths on trajectory, but you can make several trajectories at different temperatures mm -hmm. and make MDPL spectra at different temperatures and compare and see how the line width uh, depends on temperature mm -hmm. on one <coughs> and uh, dependence on the line, line width of, on temperature from experiment on another hand. Mm -hmm. I get that, I just didn't know if, like we ran our simulations at 300k, if that would overestimate non adiabatic couplings for like room temperature. That uh, was just a question. I don't know. I don't want to float that out for other people or reviewers to hear. And so, yeah, I guess I was going to redo this. I would try to frame the whole presentation of this topic around this photoluminescence quantum yield number, which we need. 
radiative and non-radiative relaxation for, which is the big parts we covered previously anyway, so. And, yeah, this is just something I was working on last night, so. For the paper that we were talking about from EPROS, basically summary they found that if you include the Rashba effect, you get uh, your lowest energy transitions which will be uh, not single, they'll be triplets mm -hmm. instead of singlets. And so, repeat again. So the lowest transitions would be triplets. If you include the Rashba effect for these perovskite quantum dots, if you just included confinement, which is this step here, your singlet is lower than your triplet. Mm -hmm. Then when, in their calculations anyway, when they included it, the single it increased, and the triplets split. I guess the, the only participant in the are, conference. Like the dimensions of your box, relative to each other, and then this energy depends on the confinement energy. So according to efforts, <coughs> the uh, singlet and triplet excitons flip their order in energy due to Rashba effect, mm -hmm. which is controlled by size of the quantum dot. But yes. if in uh, your modeling the size is not correct, this flip may not happen, and this could be responsible for lower quantum yield. Yes, and that's what... But, but, but when you say low quantum yield, you expect triplets being more less. They're more bright. In the experiments that the Afros paper did, they did like low temperature, photoluminescence and they found that the non rate or the radiative lifetime was like 250 picoseconds. Oh, but again, they are bright because there are three triplets, so you have 75% instead of, I mean, singlets versus triplets, right? So you have only a single state to emit and you have three triple states. <laughs> so, and then 33 times three will be because uh, Aaron has found quantum yield 33%. Ah. If you multiply by 3, you, you, get you get 99. <laughs> <laughs> Convincing argument. That should be in the abstract title. <laughs> no, 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 but, but the reason why is it bright? Because, not because the triplets are bright, it's because there are more triplets with the same energy. Well, I guess. I couldn't could describe the technical detail to you, but the way he described it is the singlet is optically passive. But when they did the dipole, transition dipole calculations, this was basically zero for the singlet. So it's actually the triplet states that are giving the bright photoluminescence from their calculations anyway. What is the ground state according to Everest? The ground state. Singlet. Is it the ground? Singlet, yes. So, it's it's a, so it is uh, triple to singlet uh, transitions? But again, if you have very strong spin orbit coupling, then spin is not it's a, not a problem. Quantum right. quantum yeah. number. Okay. I mean, so you will have this transition same. That's kind of what I see, because I've done some calculations where I track magnetization mm -hmm. during uh, the cooling. Once it gets to the band edges, it's. But is it correlate, does it correlate with your results? So you have a. S uh, singlet, like your alpha beta, if, you, if you're not including spin orbit coupling, so then your singlet transitions, your, your low state is dark or is optically inactive. Or it's. So for the spin restricted calculations. Because you can look on your triplets in the spin restricted calculations, right? right. And, and kind of. I guess the lowest get, get the idea was, which of them will be like would, would they cor uh, correspond to this uh, conclusions whether your singlets will have less optically active transitions compared to triplet state because you, you can just look where is your alpha and beta for creating a triplet state mm -hmm. and that would go back to my absorption spectra slide mm -hmm. looking at those density of states mm -hmm. oh, and specifically so like just the low state right yeah like the ones near the band edges like the four yeah, one the should lowest. be just, let's say, alpha, alpha, or whatever your low state, beta, beta, alpha, alpha, without spin flip, right? Mm -hmm. And the other ones with the spin flip, which corresponds to your triplet state. Because oh, I see. You, you construct your triplet state like this, or like that, or like that, so at least one of these will be already your triplet state. I see what you're saying. So, so yeah, they actually, for the LUMO, there's two. So they're twice degenerate in energy, the bands are, so there's four transitions for the whole LUMO. Yes. And then the spin flips. 
from what I could tell, there wasn't really necessarily a trend. It's like the top two was a spin flip and a non-spin flip. The oh, two brightest. So you have actually both of them upright. Yes. Then. So it looks like you're not really yes. in agreement with him, <laughs> with his model. Which again might be because your wave functions is really perturbed, as you're showing in your first part of the talk, right? Mm -hmm. So we we have. Splitting in energies is different comparing to the simple model. Well, the discussion and is par partially addressed on the, on the next slide. And the wave functions are also not exactly the same as, uh, as this model is given, which might affect, of course, the uh, selection rules as well. Can you get kicked out? Oh. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'll, I'll bring it back. And it is like a vast slide door. So their assumption was throughout the calculations they were in the intermediate confinement range. So like... Oh, the size is also different. Yeah, so they label it like 16 to 5 nanometers is intermediate. So we would be more up in this confinement region, so that's where the theory would break down a little bit. And you might get... Oh, who knows how the states are going to re reorganize them. That was one thing I was planning on looking at. And that is the last slide. Do we'll ever get there? Or I take it back. This is the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thank uh, Aaron. Let's thank everyone for patience of staying longer. And uh, if anyone is not satisfied with the discussion, there is a chance to ask uh, Aaron more questions. Let's go with the rule. At least each of you should ask at least do, one do, do question. Don't disappear. There could be more questions. And we go from the very last row. Fatima, your turn to ask a question. At least one, right? <laughs> so my question is, uh, like, uh, you, you presented uh, what you will do, or? A little bit of both. So what I've done and what I plan to do, it wasn't totally organized that way. I tried to put some slides of what I'm going to do in the future. Uh, yeah. So, right? Nice, I think. What you will do and what you already did. Yeah, so for the first couple I did, so I described what I did for the density of states and what's missing and further work I could do. Okay. So, so future work for uh, modeling the ground state structure would be trying to find the envelope functions of the DFT calculation weight functions. Okay. So that's one possible thing I'm looking to do in the future okay. for that project. And yeah, so it's a mix of both. So in one of those last slides that you were talking about, you have uh, you basically come to the conclusion that your excited state modeling needs to have non-zero magnetization. That's that's what the Nature paper would describe says. Okay. That's what they predicting. I guess I just don't really understand like the figure in the bottom there. They have like the box and an inversion asymmetry direction. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. I well, guess. That's, so that's the Rashba effect. So that's so if you have spin over coupling in your system with inversion symmetry. So it's like, if you don't have a perfect cubic structure, yeah. like if you have one of your atoms, they're displaced, you're gonna have some sort of an internal electric field which create a magnetic field and then couplings happen. Yeah. That's the rough thing. Okay. Very non-technical language. But to see the rush by fact, you need to apply the magnetic field. Am I right? Or it's an internal, oh, it's a crystal. Okay. You don't need to. Right. So, so it's, it's just an internal field which is going kind of in an opposite direction to the, like what exactly reverse or invert? So it'd be, so if you had a surface and you had a field going perpendicular to the surface, uh -huh. then in, in that direction you'd have some sort of Rashba effect. Ah, okay. So your internal field should be really be in kind of in a special direction with respect to your surface. Mm -hmm. So you could have it in X, Y, or Z for some sort of combination. 
and I guess it's not really known in Prescott what causes it, whether it's due to surface or if it's due to like misalignment it's of the cesium in the middle that caused the charges. have any ligands with them already and then passivate them. Well cyanides are known as a very good ligand for many metal organic complexes right mm -hmm. so they naturally hybridized and uh, coordinate with uh, transition metals including that. Yeah, so this, the so this probably is the reason why they look on this uh, ligands because they're just very common ligands and again um, it has to be also negatively charged, right? Because it has to substitute for carboxylic groups to be attached to the right. positively charged land. And the sulfur satisfies that? It has a negative charge on it? Well, so isocyanide also has this charge because let's say you can use pyridine. So you were showing actually, uh, some of your slides showing the other, yeah, like this ligands, right? I guess some of them might be neutral. I don't know exactly how they, yeah, looks like almost of them, like, like this uh, right one. Is it, it looks, looks like this probably will be neutral ligand. Uh, John, if, 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 they not, if they not really functionalize it with some uh, negatively charged group. Mm -hmm. But technically, again, this, this type of ligands or molecules kind of probably well known just from coordinated inorganic chemistry. So and the choice is just to have a ligands which, which can coordinate the transition methods of maybe of specific groups. Yeah, the Paul Acevedo guy, he's been, like, like, I didn't know who he was before this paper, but I looked up his Google Scholar, and he had like a research index of like 100 or something ridiculous. So I guess he works in, he's been working in this field for like 20 years, so he knows all the little tricks. Tim Leon? Things to try. Hmm? Who, Tim Leon? Uh, Paul Acevedo. Oh, Did you slide? Yes. So I guess my question would be, um, you talk about particle in a box versus DFT, like way back, way in the beginning. You don't have to go back to it. Okay. But, um, my question would be, is there any particular reason you're looking at particle in a box? Like, would there be any advantage in modeling this as particle in a box? Um, just to see if... Yeah, see if you can use a simple model to describe something that's a little more complex, like DFT, or see if the trends in DFT correspond to... How long it takes you to do just optimization of your structure from DFT? Uh, Days? Hours? Uh, I think Monsters? this one took like a month. See? Just because the system is really huge, much bigger than anything you were working. So, and, uh, like, to what, get what? all this data, it took you probably years, <laughs> right? Yeah, like To half collect a year. all of them. Yes. <laughs> It's a process for something this size. Yeah, and particle in the box, you were working on it less than months, right? Yeah, well, I think. But how, how the size and shape of your quantum dot uh, relates to the cubic box? What's the shape of the, of the quantum dot? Oh, it, it's naturally a cube. So it's, I guess uh, before this, a lot of like cat selenide, which Svetlana works on, it's more spherical in shape. It's not a perfect sphere, but it's. You, you were working on it, right? Of course, so, you cannot call it a sphere. 
But you cannot call it a cube as well. <laughs> you can approximate it as a sphere. It's a spherical cow. But, but his structure definitely has much more pronounced uh, cubic symmetry. So you can use particle in a box instead of... I guess the effective mass is designed for spheres. So... Again, effective mass is not really for, for any specific shape. Af affected by the size or the shape because it's technically taken just from the bulk calculations from the solid crystal, right? So that's why you, they usually take effective mass just from the bulk, and then all other parameters, uh, with your size, right, which leads to the confinement and the bulk functions again coming from the from the bulk. Mm -hmm. But you will see yeah, you'll how learn you solve you'll learn. particle in the box yes. problem yeah. in quantum mechanics, so undergraduate students can solve it, at least in quantum No, no, but there is no, uh, there is no actually sites available to put a ligand at that point, right? right. Are you just saying just put so it in the box just to make the cell neutral? Yes. Oh, just a particle in the box? No, I don't know, just like make it, the in the unit system. or in the vast periodic cell. Neutral. Just you have your quantum dot and then just put two like, negatively charged ligands. Or just maybe to make the whole cell free floating right. uh, counter ions. Right. right. I guess not not on the surface, but a, a way right. so somewhere. I guess you could, but then but you could do it for ground state. Well, but anyway, you're but not exactly, but this is how the VASP is calculating the charge, right? So the charge is introduced as a field, kind of like like to. Don't forget, in VASP you use periodic boundary conditions. This is very different from Gaussian when people do charges in a Gaussian. It's not a problem. For VASP, it's a problem because you, you, you duplicate, right? You replicate the unit cell infinite number of times. So it means you don't have two plus charge. You have two plus charge infinite times, times infinite times for the, for, the, for the replicas, which means you will have not realistic results if you just add the charge. So to avoid this, what is happening, let's say you have in plus two charge, right? So it is assumed that, that you have a point charge, negatively charged point charge, on the edges of your cell, kind of, which is far away, taken far away from, from the actual system, right? And it's not really point charge, it's a field which having a source, means it's more dense uh, charge, at the edges of your unit cell, and then it's kind of uh, reducing, kind of exponentially decaying to uh, coming closer and closer to the system. So you don't really have interaction between the field and the system, but your cell becomes neutrally nu neutral, right? Because you're kind of adding two minus charge, which is spread over the entire unit cell with uh, not uniform distribution of the charge. So it's a field with not uniform distribution of the charge, which is kind of very similar to what you expect from the counter ions, right? Because your counter ions do not really interact with the system; they're not really having this uh, electrostatic interaction. Because if they do, we we should see really optimized. very strong effect of this interaction and all our models, if you're not including contrains, will be completely wrong, right? So they don't really interact directly through the electrostatic effect because they are probably very far away somewhere, right? So that's why they're not really interacting. But they create kind of a very weak field, uh, not uniformly distributed, and rebalancing the charges, right? So that's why I would say the it's already kind of a modeling or whatever, simplified model of counter-ion effects is already included in the VASP calculations. So I'm not sure whether you, uh, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't think that if you really add this negatively charged, or you can think just point charges, right? Two negatively charged point charges to balance, to balance the charge, make neutral 
I think you will not really see significant effect comparing to the charge one because of this uh, uh, technical issue with the VASP. How is it? Uh, how is it really doing this charge calculation things? Is that the paper? Or is that from the paper that you referenced for the reviewer that we were talking about? Or is that the same Which idea? Paper? Okay. Marco from Spain. What's the idea? They oh, why you not using counter? Uh, they expl lines? explain how stabilization of uh, charge by compensation of charge in VASP mm -hmm. to avoid the infinite Coulomb repulsion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, I mean it's very valid kind of comment, but but from practical point of view, I I don't think you really need to worry about it. Yeah, then when they're insolvent, it's like they don't like in a physical system if they. The quantum dots are charged. They're going to be screened by solvent a little bit too, so they could exist. More questions? If no, let's thank Aaron once again. So um, please bring, please submit your. Uh, I'll take your. Please submit your comments to the speaker. Uh, speakers, uh, please do not uh, discard these uh, comments, but use them to improve and implement all comments in uh, your slides for the future. And uh, oh, next Friday? time... Friday. Uh, I could use it. Friday, Alisa, right? Oh, yeah, Alisa. Is she just, just Alisa, no one on Friday from your group? So far, Alisa on there. And uh, next, Tuesday, next Tuesday, there is a chance to present for, for John and for Alisa on, on her research. In two weeks, Fatima and uh, Daniel. In two weeks, so uh, there, there are expectations that you you'll do something with non invariant couplings and dynamics. Yeah. It's a, it's a big challenge. And then uh, in the we also in the have research presentations on Friday after two weeks, I guess, start, starting like beginning of August. There will be research presentations on Friday from my group. Okay, good. And in three weeks uh, we'll start uh, drilling the posters for ACS conference. Right. When is the ACS conference? It's like the middle of August sometimes. Middle of August, but starting from 19, July exactly. starting from July thirty first, we will have last meeting in July and two first meetings in August to drill okay. the posters. Just bring them on the big screen and uh, quickly guide and uh, survive the questions. Okay. Thank you much for the questions and for the dedication. Well thank everyone. Uh, see you on Friday.